the rise and fall in the status of Devdasis can be seen to be running parallel to the rise and fall of Hindu temples. As the temples became poorer and lost their patron kings, in some cases the temples were completely destroyed, the Devdasis were forced into a life of poverty, misery and in many cases prostitution. The problem of the Devdasi system is that it continued in spite of centuries of decline of temples, absence of patron kings and without the related social support systems. With the Anti-Devdasi Act of 1947, a system which took centuries of perfecting was abolished. In the process, the baby which is the art form was thrown with the bath water. The provisions of this act of 1947 also stipulated that dance not be performed in the temples and dancers not be kept in temple service while this sanitized or clinically cleaned the system at surface level no one thought of the fate of the dancers or their future. In such a scenario, it was but natural that all kinds of issues were faced by the dancers and musicians and their families. The irony was that the Devdasi, who was a non-Brahmin, became a victim of the politics of anti-Brahminism of Dravidian parties on one hand and of the Christian missionaries and colonial rulers on the other hand. The support to Devdasis came from two unexpected quarters, Brahmins and Theosophists. The espousal of the dance by Brahmini dominated Theosophical and Congress circles was used by the British government officials to play up suspicions in non-Brahmin circles against not only the dance but also against the movement of nationalism. The political lines were now drawn very clearly. On one side were British officials, Christian missionaries and backward non-Brahmins. On the other side were European unofficial Theosophists, Congress and Brahmins. The former used everything in their power to kill the dance and its community of performers, the Devdasis. The latter tried to preserve and promote the dance as a national art. The efforts of the latter helped the emergence of a neat class of amateur performers, but the efforts of both sides led to the demise of centuries-old performer known as the Devdasis. Dance had been a vital element of temple worship in South India until the Devdasi Bill was passed in 1947. This law made it illegal to dance on temple grounds, in effect destroying all support for the Devdasis to continue learning and sharing their art. During the British occupation of India, confusion and fear had taken hold and a group of influential elite pushed the law into effect the same year that India gained independence from Britain. A small number of dedicated artists continued to carve a place for the dance to survive amidst the extremely charged political landscape. During that time, Bala Saraswati, an extraordinarily brilliant dancer and musician, brought public attention to the importance of maintaining dance as a sacred communion with God. Others, such as Rukmini Devi, founded schools that promoted a revised version of the dance that was more suited for the stage as its venue rather than the temple. With the abolition of the Devdasi system, and the dance services in the temple, the parampara practitioners were seriously affected. Suddenly, an ancient art form was displaced and usurped by a class of practitioners who knew nothing about its intricacies and etiquettes. The new practitioners wanted to learn the art and had to form the same Devdasis and Natunars. The revivalists wanted to preserve the traditional form of Sadir dance by purifying it. The new name was given as Bharatanatyam. As a sequence of purification, some modifications were introduced into the content of the dance style. 
the revivalists were basically belonging to Brahmin dominated theosophical circles. Many Brahmin girls started to learn the dance from Devdasis, hence the dance technique remained unchanged. The only change was change in the class of clientele. The themes were picked up from Sanskrit texts. Higher caste girls learned the dances and put them in new settings, which included Devdasi traditions. And the dance form became individual oriented from the community oriented. The traditional dancers in Natuvanars had to move where new patronage could be found. Thus, there was a procession from Tanjore to Madras city. Not only a few artists and gurus could make the relocation. Very few dancers survived it, but for the fact that this parampara dancers were featured in the historic series at Music Academy during 1931-40, to 40, the Natuvanas would likely not have come to Madras. It is frightening to imagine what would have happened to the art if the Music Academy series had not been conducted. If the sixth conference of the Music Academy in 1932 was epoch-making, the seventh in 1933 was a conference of consolidation. It was presided over by Vidwan K. Punaya Pillai, professor of music at Annamalai University and descendant of Sivanandan of the Tanjur Quartet. This conference had the unique distinction of having many doyens of the dance world as its expert participants. On its third day, Pandanalur Minakshi Sundaram Pillai presented a paper in which he explained the nature and future of South Indian dance. On the last day, another famous exponent of dance held the floor. Bharatam Nallur Nayan Swami Ayer gave a lecture on the art of Bharata, the Indian dance. He explained at length with numerous examples the three branches of art namely Bhava, Raga and Tala. Scholar Dr. V. Raghavan seems to have taken an active part for the first time in this conference. He moved as many as six resolutions which were passed without discussion. The following is the text of one of them. Resolved that the Academy do represent to Hindu Religious Endowments Board that steps should immediately be taken to see that Tevaram, Vaishnava Prabandhams, Bharatanatyam, Nagaswaram and other temple musicals are again made part of the daily offering to the God in all temples. On the whole, the 1933 conference was noteworthy for the recommendations for reviving and refining the dance which were mooted and accepted. In the years that followed, dance recitals rather than discussions about the art and its future held center stage. Artists from families which considered dance as a hereditary profession dominated the stage until 1936. The first non-professional dancer at the academy was a Brahmin girl, Balachandra, in December 1938. In the following year, two girls, Lakshmi Sastri and Kalanidhi of similar background danced. Since the prestigious platform at the Music Academy could not be made available, except to a few outstanding artists, many who had taken up Bharatanatyam in right earnest and wished to perform in public, had to stage their art and recitals under the auspices of various sabhas and associations. Among those who danced were disciples of many Natunars who had gone into hibernation in a manner of speaking during the time the dance was under a cloud. According to E. Krishna Ayer, who was closely associated with the revival of Bharatanatyam, the date 1st January 1933, the date of the second dance recital of the Kalyani daughters, was to be taken as the date of renaissance of Bharatanatyam. In one of the most unique cultural restorations of dance encountered anywhere in the world, everything about the dance changed. From being a fragment of history, shriveling in the margins of impoverishment, Bharatanatyam empowered itself to become the ubiquitous Indian classical dance. From a surreptitious caste-bound practice, it became a wondrous art form that tore its caste and regional definitions to capture the entire nation's popular and critical imagination. From being a fragile ritualistic dance that originated in the temples of South India, it became a vehicle for flagrant performance. From a secluded and sacred art, it became public. From temple lintel to proscenium stage, it became object of celebration and some abuse. Those who did not belong to the traditional community drew inspiration from the beauty of the dance as performed 
by the members of the Devdasi community. Even Rupni Devi Arundel was inspired to learn Bharatanatyam only when she saw some of the traditional dancers perform at the music academy, the mecca of music and dance in Madras those days. And she learnt the dance from traditional Natunars, not from textbooks. In this respect, the series at Music Academy, organized by E. Krishna Iyer, well-known barrister and activist and writer on dance and music, with active collaboration of dancers of the traditional community, played a vital and critical role indeed. Four individuals in that period who played a critical role in the renaissance of Bharatanatyam were E. Krishna Iyer, Tanjore Balasaraswati, Kamla and Rukmini Devi Arundel. There are many, many more, but in this period and point in time of the history, these four became catalysts. Regression analysis shows that if the E. Krishna Iyer had not campaigned for saving the dance from extinction, and if he had not arranged the historic series at the Music Academy, the dance would have failed to gain respectability and hence would not have survived or survived long enough for anyone else to try and play the role of a saviour. It also shows that without the cooperation of the dancers of the traditional community, Krishna Iyer would not have been able to convey the beauty of the art to a wider public. Rupni Devi clothed the dance with her exquisite taste and added new dimensions to it. Kamla inspired hundreds of others to learn and perform Bharatanatyam and M.K. Saroja also added to its body because as talented dancers they were young and Kamla became a role model others could not follow. Bharatanatyam's best specimens Ram Gopal, Bala Saraswati, Rukni Devi did not question tradition when they came centre stage as early as in 1930s. Why? Because they were reviving and resurrecting an almost dead art or they were proud to continue the art of their masters as taught to them. This was the basis of much tom tom Guru Shishya Parampara or the technique of transmission of art orally from a master to a pupil and so the chain continued. Remember, most masters were men. Why? Because belonging to the caste of Devdasis, who were by inference women of loose morals, from a prudish Victorian point of view, their offsprings born outside wedlock were illegitimate, simply put. To change their status and standing in society, they were trained and equipped in the art of their families, i.e. to teach and conduct dance recitals. Hence, most such men became venerated masters, natuvanars or conductors of such stars of the form as make legends today. The coming of several institutions in the decade after the visit by foreigners of note led to creation of many major institutions like the Kerala Kalamandalam, Kalakshetra and Santiniketan to specifically teach and nurture traditional Indian dances that happened after this decade, that is the 1920s. The offshoot of this was an engagement of traditional teachers who left the rural moorings and came to teach in big cities like Madras and much later, Delhi. Chief among these were Muthukumar and Pillai, who travelled maximum and helped propagate Bharatanatyam in two cities, Madras for 12 years and Ahmedabad for two. Guru Minakshi Sundam Pillai, six months at Kalakshetra and Ramya Pillai, 30 years in Madras. Gurus Elappa, Kitappa and Subraya Pillai all based themselves in Madras and taught many. It is through this early and pioneering figures that Bharatanatyam got its style and structure, form and content as we mostly see today. In modern times, few gurus who have distinguished themselves are the Dhananjans in Bharatanatyam, Kalamandalam Brahmakutti Asan and Kalamandalam Gopi in Kathakali, Pandit Birju Maharaj in Kathak. While alive, Guru Keluchuran Mahapatra did a lot for Odissi, Vempati Chinna Satyam and Nataraj Ramakrishna in Kuchpuri, Guru Amobi Singh and later Bipin Singh in Manipuri, all males. These are our national icons who have nurtured and furthered parampara of Abhyas mode of teaching and learning and acquiring Natya. Most taught at Kalakshetra, but some also 
taught dance for films as Madras also became center for films before Bombay came up. Many productions needed and used classical dances, especially Bharatanatyam and thus many Natuvanars like Ramya Pillai got foothold in the film industry and they discovered talents like Kamala Lakshman, originally a disciple of Muthukumar and Pillai, Bhanumati and Vajayanti Mala. Film directors like Subramaniam, Padma Subramaniam's father also made dance films and gave many dancers an opportunity to show their talents. Uday Shankar was based in Madras in 1940s to make an iconic film Kalpana which discovered the Travancore sisters Lalita, Padmini, Ragini and Guru Gopinath. Dance was now popular thanks to certain opportunities in films and on stage. Within a decade, the baby had been thrown and bath water used. The last Devdasis like Mailapur Gauri Ammar attached to Kapalishwar Temple Madras taught expressional dance to some first generation dancers like Rukni Devi, Kalanidhi and others. The late 19th and earlier 20th century saw the merchant community of Chettiars and Mudalayars support the arts when many displaced artists moved to Madras. Slowly, sabhas were set up and shows of dance and music, Chinna and Periya Melam were held in these thatched roofed sit out sabhas. Around 1899-1900, the first sabha came into existence in Madras. The 100 year old Triplicane Parthasarthi Sabha is one of the oldest. These sabhas were not involved in presenting dance. Founded in 1927, the Music Academy was the only sabha which took up the fight for dance. Founded in 1927, the Music Academy was the only sabha which took up the fight for saving Sadiratam thanks to enlightened members like E. Krishna Iyer and others. However, it was not till the late 70s and early 80s that sabha started dominating the dance scene. Stages were built and dance moved from temple to proscenium stage. The influence of dancers who had travelled to West or come from West also aided this process. From 1920s, many foreigners like Anne Pavlova, Ted Sean, La Mary, Louis Lightfoot and travel lighters like Beryl Desort and others came from and saw what was written Hindu or Oriental dances. Artists like Ram Gopal and Uday Shankar, having travelled west before 1940s, also brought in western stage sense, costumes, lights and colours. Indian arts met western aesthetics off stage. When the dance performances left the precincts of the temple to that of the court, a change in content was observed. The songs used were now in praise of the kings or the patrons of the day. The kings and the patrons, the present nayakas of the lyrical content, were eulogized as devotees of Lord Shiva and Lord Rama in their varied forms and some bhakti content was sustained. Till the end of the 19th century, from temple to court performances prevailed. In the 20th century, when dance entered the proscenium stage, margam was continued by the revivers of this art form. The transition seemed seamless as Indian artists were very adroit and adaptable while maintaining traditions. They could infuse new ideas and new directions that the society and its times demanded. The dancers and musicians who were unexposed to world outside their village or temple were now in mainstream city life. Important Devdasis, families like Bala Saraswati, M.S. Subalakshmi moved to Madras or as we call Chennai today. Swarna Saraswati moved to Delhi and dance moved from temple to the wide world stage. While Indian dances and dancers have reached out to most of the corners of the world now, thanks also to Indian diaspora or Indian settled abroad celebrating Indian culture and art forms have become also original catalysts who were a few pioneering foreigners and traditional gurus who inspired many Indians to relook at their own ancient dance traditions. They played 
a significant role in shaping the fortunes of Indian dances. Male dancers and gurus and teachers helped define and shape Indian classical dance in first phase of what we call revival which is from 1920s to 1950s. Some forms were also all male done only by men like Kuchipudi, Satriya, Kathakali and Yakshagana. Today we see many changes and fewer males. Most teachers and gurus are females and most forms have more women dancers than male dancers. This is a big change in the post-independence last 50-60 years of the transition. What will come next? Thank you.